content warning. This one's going to be a lot about colonialism and child slavery. What did you think it was going to be a silly video about M&Ms? You fell for my clickbait again. Dance, puppet, dance! <laughs> Mars Inc., who own M&Ms, had a itty bitty public relations snafu recently. Somehow, through no fault of their own, they became embroiled in a child slavery lawsuit from a bunch of adults in Mali who were once kids but are now adults and were enslaved to work on farms to produce cocoa for Mars Inc., among other companies, allegedly. Eight children who claim they were used as slave labor on cocoa plantations in Ivory Coast have launched legal action against the world's biggest chocolate companies. They accuse the corporations of aiding and abetting the illegal enslavement of thousands of children on cocoa farms in their supply chains. Nestle, Cargill, Barry Calibut, Mars, Olam, Hershey, and Mondelez have been named as defendants in a lawsuit filed in Washington, D.C. by the human rights firm International Rights Advocates, or IRA, on behalf of eight former child slaves who say they were forced to work without pay on cocoa plantations in the West African country. In their lawsuit, the group of men alleged that they were forced to work on the cocoa farms for 12 to 14 hours a day. They also said they were kept under armed guard while they slept in order to prevent them from escaping, and were paid little beyond basic food. Now, nobody wants their brand associated with child slavery simply because of the decades of forced labor by children used to make their products. I don't need to say allegedly for that, by the way. Mars Inc. doesn't deny that child slavery might have been used in some of the farms where they buy their cocoa. But don't get mad at, don't get mad at Mars. You should get mad at the child traffickers, not Mars. Just because they profited from that child slavery doesn't mean that they're responsible for it. What are they supposed to do? Go there and check the farms themselves? Ridiculous. Follow through on any of the many promises they've made to end these practices? Impossible. Their only choice in this situation was sadly to receive the cocoa, process it into sugary pellets of pseudo chocolate, sell it for billions of dollars and not question anything. All of this happened outside the United States. So according to the Supreme Court, they're not criminally liable. That's practically the same thing as being innocent. They're innocent adjacent. Needless to say, Mars Inc. needed some ridiculous thing to get people's attention before the whole probably made with child slaves thing impacted sales. They announced that the M&M mascots, which they inexplicably call lentils in-house, I have, I, have, I have no words, would become more inclusive. They'd wear less gendered clothing and their skin tones would match their candy shells instead of just being nominally white person-ish. Uh, but from what I can tell in the redesigns I've seen, they actually made the arms literally white instead of just being white like Macklemore. So that ought, to, that, that ought to do it. Because the problem here, obviously, is that the M&Ms did not represent enough people. Some people might have felt excluded as though they themselves could not become anthropomorphized M&Ms. To quote their website, one for all and all for fun? M&M's is a chocolate brand on a mission. We believe in championing the power of fun to create a world where everyone feels they belong. Now this isn't said out loud, but I assume what they mean by that is that some people will belong in nice air conditioned offices, others in sweatshops. Some of them obviously are gonna have to work vast cocoa fields without being paid and they'll be shot if they try to run away. Some people belong in mansions that they bought using money from selling ruinously unhealthy food to children and lobbying international governments to prevent regulations that would make doing so more difficult. Fun is not planned, it is found. And there's plenty to discover with M&Ms. Fun can cross borders and boundaries. Hey, you know who can't cross boundaries? The children that are enslaved to make the M&Ms because of the armed guards that would shoot them. Fun can bridge differences and divides. Best of all, there's always more of it when you aren't the only one having it. Our ambition is to upend the expected, break through barriers, and discover the little joys shared in everyday life. Imagine a world with less judgment and more connection and consistent laughter. Together, we can make this reality for all fun kind. The unbridled malevolence on display here cannot be overstated. Firstly, I think creating a world with less judgment and more connection, whatever the fuck that means, is beyond the purview of a candy to do. Secondly, I would argue that one of the most important barriers that can come between two people is who is and is not a slave. One way to increase the net amount of fun in the world, one thing you could try if that was your goal, is uh, 
not support the institution of slavery, like abolish slavery. That slavery is notably unfun. Like one of the ways that I feel like you're you're not contributing to fun is that you're giving huge gobs of money to to slaveholders for the work that their child slaves did under penalty of death. And isn't it so fucking ghoulish to use the idea of inclusivity to cover up a scandal about how this product was produced by slaves in West Africa? To act as though you're making a commitment to some sort of social justice by adjusting the skin tones of your mascots while actively profiting from the ongoing colonialist exploitation of Africa and African people, children no less? By the way, lest the Steven Pinkers of the world pipe up and say some shit like, well, as tragic as it is, it's better that these kids, with no other economic prospects, be forced to work than left to starve. Oh, the moral pain of it! But we must accept the lesser evil. Not really. These kids were kidnapped from their families, who presumably, had they not been kidnapped, would have taken care of them. In the legal claim, all eight plaintiffs describe being recruited in Mali through trickery and deception before being trafficked across the border to cocoa farms in Ivory Coast. There, they were forced to work, often for several years or more, with no pay, no travel documents, and no clear idea of where they were or how to get back to their families. During fieldwork for this case, the plaintiff's legal team say that they routinely found children using machetes, applying chemicals, and undertaking other hazardous tasks on cocoa plantations that were producing for one or more of the defendants. And this leads me to a question. Do you feel that this in any way champions the power of fun? See, this is the type of emergent evil that can only arise in our particular late capitalist hellscape. Obviously, the West has been profiting from slavery for centuries. All of my clothes were probably made by slaves. My cell phone was made using minerals mined by slaves. None of us is free of sin in this fallen earth, etc., etc. Back in ye olden days, everyone could agree there's slavery happening. And then everybody cool would say, well, they've got to do something about that. That's got to be stopped by any means necessary. Even the ghouls who like slavery or maybe profited from it didn't pretend like it wasn't happening or that the karmic weight of slavery could be evened out by using nicer words to describe it or making the slaves feel more included. So a problem arose when the general, non-enslaved public started to realize that slavery was a pretty fucked situation actually. Suddenly, if you're a slave guy, it makes people pretty mad at you. Well, what are you gonna do? Pay people for their work? That's too expensive, by which I mean there is any expense at all. I deserve all of that money. I'm white. The true innovation of 21st century colonialism and onwards was making the problem of slavery and exploitation of the global south more generally impossible to talk about. So obfuscated and nebulous that even if you had the moral courage to condemn it, you wouldn't even really know how to do it effectively. No longer can a country be exploited or colonized. Now they're simply being developed. You see, we're building them up so they can be like us, which is confusing to me because we can only be like us because of the mountains of cash we extract from them. Oh, our heart may break for the injurious conditions of sweatshop workers. But if we boycott companies which use sweatshops, those workers won't have any employment at all. Besides, think of how this helps the local economy of their country. It puts money in everyone's pocket, more of it in ours, but some of it in theirs, and that gradually lifts everyone out of poverty citation needed. Boiled ham and economist Jeffrey Sachs argues that if any country demands higher wages or better working conditions, that just takes them out of the market as companies naturally look to invest in the cheapest alternatives. In the long run, if everyone competes to have lower wages, that somehow raises the global floor of how low a wage can go, and this is what he actually out loud claims to believe. One of my signature catchphrases on this channel is, economists log off. In this case, though, that, uh, that is not strong enough. In this case, economists drop dead. And hey, it might look like the conditions are pretty bad, but check your privilege, actually, because if Nike wasn't there providing jobs for local people, they'd be forced back into medieval squalor. They simply would not be able to produce something as mechanically complex as a sneaker without us there teaching them how. Because, because, because what I'm saying, but not out loud, mm -hmm. is that they're not as smart as we are. We need to educate them so they can be smart like us. Why, if you think about it, the burden is on us, not them. We're helping. They're simply receiving help. It's our burden to bear. A sort of white man's burden, if you will. 
Of course, I would never say such things out loud. I'm simply appealing to the part of you that we have deliberately cultivated through centuries of racist programming, Eurocentric education, and good old-fashioned chauvinism to secretly believe it. That way, if anyone criticizes me for it, I never directly said it, I just kind of implied it. And even when you do manage to tiptoe around the logical quagmires that every neoliberal stooge wants to drag you down into to distract from the hellish white supremacist violence our entire civilization is fueled by, they always have the fallback of saying, but you buy things. You claim not to like exploitation, yet here you are owning things produced by exploitation. Checkmate. And that makes any condemnation of the horrible labor practices of these monolithic corporate hell spires and the local contractors they employ to dodge accountability appear hypocritical. The reality, of course, is that we are forced to participate in an interlocking web of oppressive systems as both oppressor and oppressed. Now, not all of us participate as equals in that web of oppression, mind you. Many of us participate in more than our fair share of oppressing, but none of us can escape it. It cannot be done as long as the web exists. Like an actual web, the more you struggle, the more entangled in it you become, until eventually you are eaten alive by Goldman Sachs, who are a spider in this analogy. And that's harder to explain to people, especially when they don't particularly want to hear it. It's much easier to give someone some hand-wavy platitude that makes them feel okay with everything. They don't resist when you do that. You might notice that among many leftists, the sentence, there is no ethical consumption under capitalism, has come to serve this function. Well, I don't like that soda streams are made in illegal settlements in the West Bank, but there's no ethical consumption under capitalism. So what I'm gonna do is just whatever I, I wanted to do in the first place, that's probably the, for the best, I think. And no, there isn't ethical consumption under capitalism, but there are degrees of unethical behavior. The fact that nothing you can buy is free from exploitation doesn't lift the moral burden upon you to at least make an effort to decrease that exploitation. That saying is meant to convey that you can't buy a more ethical product to consume your way out of capitalism. Not that you should just buy whatever, who cares? We're all mixed up in this huge system of slavery and exploitation that we've let PR companies spin into a morally neutral fact of life, something that just happens as a consequence of natural economic laws or the growing pains of development or whatever. It's just a thing that's gonna happen no matter what we do. It cannot be prevented, and any attempt to prevent it will only make things worse for the people you wanted to help. But the key to all of it, the only reason that the PR works is because it preys on the fact that None of us fat cats in rich countries like thinking about it. My hands get all sticky when I think about all the blood that's on them. But every so often, a story will be heinous enough to break through into the mainstream, like this child slavery lawsuit in Mali did. And sometimes it might look very bad to say, well, actually, we think it's good that our contractors are kidnapping children and forcing them to work as slave labor to make our products cheaper. Actually, what that does is it helps development. It's good for the economy. If that seems like a bad thing to say out loud, they always have the fallback plan of aggressive, targeted nonsense blasted directly into our skulls. The demons who decided on the messaging about the candy's new skin and the arch demons who okayed the child slave farms probably didn't coordinate those efforts. Mars Inc. is a huge company and they've probably never even met each other. Corporations like to make it difficult to even find a person or group of people to pin the blame for any of their decisions on. It's just the machine that was left running. The marketing department saw a PR problem. It did not matter what the substance of that problem was and responded with the same inane, time-wasting bullshit that they know will distract us all every time. In our current media ecosystem, it's easier than ever to flood people's brain engines with unfiltered liquid nonsense. Which brings us, briefly, I promise, to Tucker Carlson. Tucker wasn't too happy about them making the candy mascots less fuckable, and I wrote that joke to exaggerate Tucker's position. I thought that that would be like a silly heightening of his position that would make him look like a fool. But then I watched the video of it, and that, that's literally what he says. That's his stated position. He is self-admittedly mad about the M&M being less sexy. The brown M&M has, quote, transitioned from high stilettos to lower block heels also less sexy. That's progress. M&Ms will not be satisfied until every last cartoon character is deeply unappealing and totally androgynous. Until the moment you wouldn't want to have a drink with any one of them. That's the goal. When you're totally turned off, we've achieved equity. They've won. Now, full disclosure, my original plan for this video was to focus more on Tucker and how all of this is 
part of a larger fascist messaging strategy, where you deliberately dissolve any kind of meaning in order to prevent criticism. It's a thing they do. I had a whole outline about that and like how the internet bias towards irreverence makes it a perfect breeding ground for fascos, how South Park inadvertently helped revitalize mainstream anti-Semitism by giving it a cloak of ironic humor that genuine anti-Semites could drape themselves in. It was all very bread tube. It was bread tube as fuck, you would have loved it. But I realized that's not fighting the problem, that's falling for the strategy. That would be them tricking me. The reason it's a fascist technique in the first place is because it's a colonialist technique. Those two things are pretty much the same thing depending on who you do it to. Not really, it's more complicated than that. Chill Goblin goes into more detail in this video here. Go, it's linked in the description, go watch that. But it's close enough for our purposes. If I took the bait, and just mocked Tucker for wanting to fuck the M&M, even though she would never go for him. He's too old. Plus, like, I imagine she'd want someone a little more emotionally nurturing. Not just a sex partner, but an emotional partner with which she could have true intimacy. If I did that, I would be inadvertently providing cover for Mars Inc. I would be doing the exact thing their messaging strategy was designed to provoke, making this into a silly culture war exchange that distracted people from the hideous exploitation and colonialist violence at the heart of their business, at the heart of most businesses. Tucker's statements about how the desexualized M&Ms are miserable non-binary candy are sickening, don't get me wrong. Also, it doesn't really make a lot of sense because as anyone who has watched my videos can tell you, non-binary people are sexier than everyone else. But, he, but he's got to sprinkle on some bigotry there. That's part of the formula. Be, be, he has to make people feel obligated to comment, otherwise you're leaving bigotry unaddressed and thus normalizing it. Is this part of advancing his fascist ideological project or simply outrage marketing that generates clicks? Can those two things be meaningfully separated in his case? I do not know. I do not care. Be gone, foul spirit. I cast you out of my video in the name of Christ our Lord, Tucker Carlson. It makes perfect sense to me that this was the angle. It's a mastercraft of evil genius. Some big corpos using child slaves? Well, I mean, that's horrible, but not really all that shocking, is it? Because, like, in the back of our mind, we all kind of expect that. The story doesn't stick in your head. It's not novel. You're used to that, which is itself a damning indictment of the status quo, but that's not my point. My point is that when you hear they're making the M&Ms wear less sexy clothes, that they're going to desexualize the M&Ms, that sticks in the dome piece. Because what a silly thing to do! Why do they think they gotta do that? I mean, sure, we can all agree that the green M&M is sexy, but I think that sexiness doesn't spring from her appearance so much as her self-assuredness. I mean, she's so self-possessed. She has this wall up all the time. She doesn't let people in easily, so if she lets you in, it makes you feel special. I don't know, something about her. She's hard to impress, and that just makes me want to impress her. And sure, some of us may have arrangements with our wives that should it ever become possible to do so, we can pursue a sexual relationship with the green M&M. And sure, we've all spent some cold, lonely nights fantasizing about our warm bodies sticking softly to her smooth candy shell, our fingers delicately tracing a line down the hardened sugar syrup with a big M written on it that represents her torso, before she softly coos, oh no, I melt in your mouth, not in your hands. But there's nothing inappropriate about that. I mean, sure, okay, get rid of the sex boots, that's a bit much, but otherwise, what an overreaction. Boy, what a bunch of out-of-touch rubes they are over at Mars, Inc. Not me, though. I'm a media-savvy young millennial. So let me just let me just tweet about this and post about it at fucking everywhere so that news outlets have examples of what people are saying about the new direction of the M&Ms in their fawning coverage of this distraction from a human rights abuse scandal. It just so happens that in this particular case, the stated intent of this particular inane time-wasting bullshit is directly at odds with the observed behavior of the company it intends to launder the reputation of. But, you know, it could have been anything. We're gonna make two of the M&Ms get gay married. Look, we're so progressive. 
Well, it's time for the M&Ms to address cyberbullying. Frankly, it's overdue. Just because they have a hard candy shell doesn't mean they don't hurt on the inside. Hey kids, it's me, the Blue M&M, and I'm here to talk to you about the dangers of vaping. The irony of this particular case won't matter either. It doesn't matter how people react, whether they're mad or making fun of you. It doesn't even really matter when people point out that you're distracting from a scandal, which does mean that this video does nothing to hurt this strategy. All that matters is they've shifted the conversation from the real problem to whatever dumb shit they decided to make their press coverage about this week. So they just win. It, they win because it's easier to distract people than to keep them focused on, on a thing they don't want to think about. From where you're sitting, that must seem like an 18 karat run of bad luck, but the truth is, the game was rigged from the start. And I don't know about all of you, but the only all-consuming, ever-expanding network I want enslaving me to its will is the Guster and Eyeball Zone, am I right to folks? We have fun. Hello and welcome, welcome to, to the Eyeball Zone. Here in the Eyeball Zone, we usually try to mirror the discussion topic when we talk about how we put eyeballs on small craters, but in this case, that did not feel appropriate. Like if we were like, here in the Eyeball Zone, we colonize racialized people. It, you know, it's not the right vibe. It's not funny evil, it's just banal evil, you know? Hey, glaring emission in this video all about slavery and shit, thought slime? You didn't mention prison labor. You're finished. You're done for. You'll never video essay in this town again. Ah, and so you say, but I, it actually relates to the thing I'm eyeballing. Drat, you've slipped through my fingers once again, you cunning scoundrel. But you haven't seen the last of me. Here in the West, we can't just enslave people anymore. We got, if we want to have a slave, we got to put him in prison. And then we got to manufacture a reason to put them in prison. Not necessarily in that order. If you live in North America, and you probably do given what I see in my analytics, and want to combat the institution of slavery, the best thing to do is work towards prison abolition. Which is why I'm recommending a friggin' book! That's right, a book. A book I have read. Our Prisons Obsolete by Angela Davis outlines the problems with the prison industrial complex, and is a good place to start if you want to learn how, how come prisons work the way they do and why that's a problem and what we could do instead, maybe. But thought slime, you alluring minx. Angela Davis is not a small creator, but Audio Anarchy is, and they did a free reading of the book you can listen to right now, along with a bunch of other relevant texts. It's on YouTube, it's a click away. You get, you, oh, I can't read theory. Well, now you got no excuse, pal, buddy of mine. Do you have a small leftist project you need emails on? Send no more than one eyeball to thoughtslimeeditor at gmail.com with the word eyeball somewhere in the description and pertinent details such as your pronouns, and perhaps you shall find yourself trapped here in the email zone. Wait.